Okay, then I guess we'll get started. Uh, so my name is Doug Anderson. I am a software engineer on Chrome OS at Google. And today I wanted to talk to you guys about two tools for posting patches for upstream Linux, Patman and B4. So before I get into them in too much detail, I'm going to tell you stuff that you already know probably, but just in case. Uh, how patches get into Linux, we basically use an email workflow, right? So you, you post patches to the relevant mailing list, and you send it to the maintainers, and <clears throat> you figure out how to get those patches up in email. All the code review happens in email, via plain text email specifically. And then you do the code review, you get responses from maintainers and other reviewers on the list, and then it's up to you to take action on that and send a new version of your patches. And you keep doing that, sending new versions via email, getting responses via email, until everyone's happy and some maintainers land your patches. So that's the overall flow. Uh, I know there's still plans to move away from the email workflow, maybe, someday. At least, I, I could swear I heard Linus Torvalds say that, you know, eventually even he believes we need to move away from the email workflow, but it's, it's nowhere near happening right now, uh, at least for the majority of the kernels. So. We still have to figure out how to send patches. So the vanilla, if you just go and don't use any tools, the vanilla way that you send patches is you use git format patch to get your patch in a format that is ready to email out. And then you figure out who to send it to, probably by using the get maintainer script in the kernel. And then you use git send email and you manually copy the results from get maintainer to the two NCC args and maybe add a bunch of other args like maybe a subject prefix or other types of things like this. So you, you type in a big long command line to mail out your patches. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of different slight tweaks to this. Someone, when they reviewed my, my patch or my slide said, Oh, you, you don't pass the subject prefix, you pass dash v5, right? And so there's a bazillion different options. But suffice to say, you have to do a long, complicated command line argument. And probably everyone out there scripts or automates this in some way, and they roll their own way, because this is a pain in the butt. So, so the, the problems here is, like I just said, you've got to manually run get maintainer and send that to git send email. And Every time you send the next version of the patches, remember I said you got to iterate over, so every time you send the next version, you have to again construct that big long command line and get everything right. And, and it's easy to make stupid little mistakes and mess up and then you kind of look a little foolish. It happens to everyone, but it's better not to. And of course, if you're sending a big long series of patches, you're expected to send a cover letter with it. And usually you kind of have to keep track of that yourself somewhere. Or maybe you use the git branch description to store your cover letter, and there's, there's some help there for it. But it's a little awkward. <clears throat> so, and I guess the last thing here is that you know, sending patches, you need an SMTP server, which is not a terrible problem, but tends to be a problem for a lot of corp users. So if you work at random Chinese company, they may, or actually maybe even random American company, <laughs> they may not give you an SMTP server to send your patches from. So that can also be a problem here. So the first tool I want to talk about is Patman. So I've actually been, oh, and of course, I put a gratuitous picture in here. This, I just went to some generative AI and said, Patman sounds like I thought a superhero that solved crimes by patting people on the head. And so it, it kind of seemed like this like goofy little superhero would, would maybe be like a right emblem for him. But uh, <laughs> anyway, you can laugh at him. Uh, but Patman's been around for a long time. I've actually been meeting to give a talk on Patman probably for the last five or six years and never got around to it. And back at that time, Patman was the only tool like this. Since then, B4 has come along. And so what used to be my vision to give a Patman talk became a Patman and B4 talk uh, and comparing and contrasting them. So we'll see how it goes. But I do have, I'll admit, a slight bias because I've been using Patman for so long that I like using it and it, it's my workflow. Uh, and so 
I apologize for any, any bias. Uh, it was written by Simon Glass. Simon Glass has contributed some to the Linux kernel, but a lot more to U-Boot. And in fact, Patman lives in the U-Boot uh, Git repository. So it's a U-Boot tool, and it's, it's widely used in U-Boot, as far as I understand. <clears throat> and even though it's part of U-Boot, it's actually incredibly useful for Linux as well. So it has specific Linux support in it. Uh, we landed extra like uh, Linux default options that were more appropriate for Linux back in 2013. So you know, this, this is a 12-year-old tool that's explicitly had Linux support for the last 11 years. So quite a long time. But despite that, almost no one uses it in the Linux community. And the last thing I'll mention is that one of the earliest criticisms I actually heard about Patman was that it was too easy, which is really kind of funny. And it, it, it is too easy a little bit, right? So there's, uh, if you, any of you went to Dimitri's amazing talk uh, just before this, he said, hey, don't spam new versions out all the time. And don't just kind of like cram 30 patch series out into the list and things like that. Patman makes it, and so does B4 actually, but Patman and B4 both make it really easy to just, oh, let me make my changes and send it again. And you don't have to go construct that long command line argument. And therefore, it's really easy to spam new versions of your patch. And so that was kind of an early criticism in Patman, but also it was early praise too, right? Because it made it so easy. So Patman's main features are basically just to avoid you having to do the git format patch and git send email and construct all of that yourself. Uh, and so it does what a lot of people were already scripting themselves, but in a standardized way. And one of Patman's really nice things is that it helps you keep track of version history for each patch. And we'll see how this looks later, but every patch you kind of keep track yourself of what you changed in each version. And then as you send future versions, all the previous version history is maintained and then formatted really nicely. And when you first say, you're like, how could it help you, right? And you'll see as I go through some examples of what, what patches look like this. Patman will also, by default, automate calling check patch for you. So it helps you not forget to call check patch. And actually, if you have a, a long-ish pack series, it can be faster because Simon, I think a year ago, added uh, parallelization to this. So it'll call check patch and get maintainers for all your patches in parallel, and then it will you know, serialize and give you the results. So you don't have to wait quite as long. One of the things that, that Patman's features that I actually like the most is one of its earliest ones, which is to strip downstreamisms from patches. And so, I don't care so much. It was originated, Simon was on the Chrome OS team when he wrote it. And so he takes out a bunch of Chrome OS things that happen to be in patches and strips them automatically so you don't accidentally send patches with them. And I don't care much about the bug equals and test equals. Those are weird Chrome OS lines. But what I really like is that it strips out the change ID from a patch. So I happen to develop my upstream and downstream in the same kernel tree. And so when I want to build upstream Linux, I just, in the same kernel tree, check out upstream Linux, build it, and put it on my device. And then I want to test downstream. And without doing anything different, I check out downstream and build it and put it on my device. And so what that means is that in my kernel directory, I have those Garrett hooks that every time you touch anything adds change ID. And so if I use before, I have to manually remember to strip that, paint ID, that change ID out every time. With Patman, I don't have to remember. It just takes it out automatically. And so I think most people that use before have a separate kernel tree just for running before, and they maybe do their testing in that separate kernel tree, or they maybe do all of their upstream development work in that kernel tree. But that's not how I work. So. Oh, also, I guess I should mention, you can also grab uh, tags kind of like B4 can do as well. B4 does a better job of it because it interacts with lore. But Patman can also grab your reviewed by and tested by tags automatically from a patchwork server. So it's not from lore. And unfortunately, we don't actually have patchwork servers for most of LKML anymore. So it's of limited use in the kernel, but it has that feature. So the basic premise behind Patman is that 
you actually edit the patches themselves, and you put special annotation tags in the patches. And then when you use Patman to send the patches upstream, it uses those tags to get its metadata and then strips them out of the patch for you. And it uses these extra tags that you add to know what to send to get send email, what to do for a subject prefix, and how to generate version history. So what that looks like is here. So this is a, a patch that I sent out. And it's, you know, this is what my commit message on the patch looks like. It has the subject line, all the details about the patch. And then just in the commit text, a bunch of tags. And so I have the tags series version 2. It means that my whole series is at v2. Series changes 2 and some changes. That means that this patch had these changes at version 2. And then series 2 and series cc says cc and send to uh, the patch series to these people. And then, of course, I kind of nominally put change ID as a patman tag, even though it really isn't, uh, because patman not only strips the change ID, but it actually uses the, pat the change ID and encodes it into the message ID in sort of a weird way that I'll talk about in a bit. So this is what that same patch that I just annotated looks like when I send it up. And so you can see it got to all the right people uh, because of my, my series 2 and series CC. You can see that it got a nice subject line, patch v2, right? Uh, you can see that it got a message ID that is this long, wonky thing that all it's really doing is it's putting a unique thing here, the date and time, patch version, uh, patch number in the series, and then the giant change ID that my Garrett hook generated for me. The reason I originally did that is that it can help with some automation in figuring out that v2 is a newer version of v1. And if you're looking on the mailing list, you can actually figure out that two patches are related to each other because they had the same change ID thing here. The same way Garrett uses this when you upload a new version of a patch to Garrett and it replaces the old version. So it's the same concept and it, it could be useful except not that many people use it. So. And then you can also see that Patman generated after the cut a nice version history for me. And so, you know, kind of kind of nice. Version history is after the cut, patch version in the subject. And one other thing I'll mention here is that Patman by default will call get maintainer for you. And so on if you I'll I'll talk about B4 more in a bit, but in B4, you can have it call get maintainer. And it will then use that to populate your two and CC lists. Patman just, you can put twos and TCs if you want to. But in addition to that, Patman will call get maintainer on each patch and send that patch to anyone who get maintainer fingers. Uh, you can turn that off, but that's the default. And I talked about here, you know, the change ID stuff that I already kind of mentioned. So why bother? So why, I just showed you hey, you can pass all these things to get send email, but you can also put the exact same information in your commit message. So you're, you're kind of doing the same thing in two ways. Why specify it one way versus the other? What's the advantage? And mostly it's for when you send v2, v3, v4, v5, v6, v7, is that you don't have to keep on listing all the people you want to send it to and keep on listing other types of things like that. Uh, and so it becomes much more helpful as you go on. But even for v1, it, it helps give you something that's a little bit more formatted and a little bit more standardized. So people that are new often don't really realize how they should format version history. And so they kind of format it maybe in a little bit of an ugly or non-standard way. And, and sometimes maintainers grumble at people for that. Here you get something that at least is known not to piss off too many people. Uh, and the other thing I'll say here is that it, it automates calling check patch, which I find helpful, right? Like any step that I have to do manually to remember to call check patch is something I'm probably going to forget sometime. And then someone will go yell at me that I, I did something stupid. <clears throat> so Patman, I showed you so far just Patman dealing with one patch. Patman can also deal with a series of patches, obviously. And so here's some example series, and I'll go through some of the patches, how I annotated them here. So the top patch, which is the last patch in the series, 
you can see uh, I have a new tag I've never shown so far before, which is commit notes. So commit notes is a tag that says, for this patch, put this information after the cut. So it's kind of like extra notes you want for the patch that shouldn't be part of the patch description, but you just kind of want to let people know about it. Uh, and so commit notes actually shows up right before the version of history does when it, when it formats the final patch. And then uh, you can see series version, series changes, more series changes. As you can see here, I have an example where the, I'm saying the overall version of the series here is five. And on this particular patch, these things changed in V5 and these things changed in V4. And so it will then take that and give you a nice version history out of it. You can also see in this annotation, I have my cover letter. And this cover letter, the first line becomes the subject of your cover letter, and all the rest of the lines become the body text of your cover letter. So what's really weird here, right? I'll, I'll, I sort of glossed over this a little bit, but probably if you're looking at it, you're, something maybe seems a little odd. And that's that some of the tags in Patman apply to the whole series, and some of the tags in Patman apply only to one specific commit. Right? So if I look at these different tags here, series version says all of the patches in this series are v5. You can't have a series that has like some of the patches that are at v4 and some are at v3. That doesn't make sense. So the series version applies to the whole series. Series changes probably should have been called commit changes, right? Like I would be actually an interesting thing is to change it to call it commit changes because it applies only to the given commit. And so this says this particular commit had these changes at v5. This particular commit had these changes at v5. Series 2 and series CC applies to the whole series. Cover letter applies to the whole series. And so you get sort of this weird mix of things. You get used to it after a while, but when you first look at it, you're like, what the hell? Like, how is it all mixed up and why are things seem strange like this? You can see the result. Uh, oh, go ahead, question. You, uh, you might have to grab a mic from the back. I don't think we've got the mic. You might have to go grab it. Or I can just repeat your question. Check, check, yep. check. Okay. The question, uh, does it resolve any inconsistencies if you, if you have something applying to a series in one place and in another, if you have across multiple commits? Sure, so that's a good question. Uh, so what it does is it'll actually just give an error. So you can, anything that, uh, tag that applies to the whole series, if you, you can put it in any patch in the series. So you can put your cover letter in the top patch, the bottom patch, a middle patch, but if you specify cover letter more than once, Patman will yell at you and it just won't let you send the patch series. And so then you have to go delete it yourself. It doesn't try to like do anything fancy like merging. Uh, some tags like series two and series CC, those ones will be combined. And so uh, it just, anything that uh, is a tag that applies to the whole series, it just concatenates them all at once. And for anything that can be specified more than once, it's all of them. And otherwise, go ahead. Do you have any example of output for series changes? Like when you have 10 patches and each has different series changes, how yeah, does the output look like? Yeah, I'll, I'll go through some of that. So awesome. actually, in this case, uh, this, this exactly one that we're looking at, um, I've actually added this one. Some of the patches were new for V5. And so I added specifically for some of the patches. Here's the whole series. Uh, and some of the patches I added a series changes five, and this is what I wrote in it is run the unload routine if we have errors during probe new for v5. I added that specifically to that patch as series changes five. The cover letter gets the union of all of the changes from all the patches. And then we will get to patch, we'll get to more of the patches, we'll, but you'll see more examples. And if it's not clear at the end, you can ask. So the cover letter is the union of everything here. Uh, and then the changes is a union of all the changes for all the patches for all the versions. So you'll see all of the patches changes listed here for v5. And then dot, 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 here's all the changes for all the patches that said something about v2. And then 
that's pretty much it for the, the cover letter. And then the actual top patch, you can see the top patch was patch eight because the top one's the last one. Uh, and then you can see here's my commit notes, the after the cut commit notes, and then followed by the changes for this particular patch that happened in V5. Uh, and then I didn't, I didn't follow any more, didn't show any more in this particular case, but we'll look at some more patches too. So this was this, what, I, what the second patch in the series looked like annotated. So this is like, if I did a git log and I was looking at the description, this is exactly what I would see locally, right? And on this particular patch, what's unique about it is it only has series changes two. The whole, whole series version was five. This patch was two. But you can see, and I gave that this description for it. What changed in V2? Well, I added this patch in V2. It was brand new. So I just added that as kind of a default placeholder. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But then when you see what showed up on lore.kernel.org, you can see changes in V2 was this. And then Patman will add in there automatically for me. No changes since V2. So that's actually why I got in the habit of the first time I add a patch to a series, I will manually add the, this patch is new for the, ver the given series, because after that, it will, if I didn't have this, it would have said no changes since v1 automatically, even though it was introduced in v2. So it's a, there's a little bit of weird confusion there, but probably something we could fix in Patman. I just never have gotten around to it. And this is actually that example where I have no Patman tags. In the top patch in the series, I had no tags because it was there since v1 and it hadn't changed since v1. And so when I sent it, it correctly tells me no changes since v1. So I already kind of talked about most of this stuff. Some of the tags apply to all, some uh, apply to just others. You can actually just if you have patman, you can type patman dash dash full help, and it gives you the whole docs that talk about what all the tags are and what they apply to. Um, and as I said, the bottom patch had no tags, and that's fine. Uh, I did say that the cover letter had the union of all of the, the, chain, the version history of all the patches. That can sometimes get confusing, actually, because one, if you make the same change to more than one patch, then it'll be listed more than one time in that cover letter. You can solve that assuming that your version histories are all one line long by adding a process series process log sort unique. It will then sort and uniqueify all of the version history in the cover letter. So uh, that can be handy. But you also you know, you kind of do have to keep in mind that your version history is going to get put in that cover letter too. And yeah, I, I, I put in like the couple random feature requests, like, hey, it would be cool if there was a, you know, chain, commit introduced in V, and then you could just say it was introduced in V2, and then it could just do all of this stuff for you, right? Like, this patch is new since V2 or something. Uh, that would be cool. Maybe one day we'll add that. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can use Patman to collect tags like reviewed by, act by, tested by. Uh, you have to do some more complicated things because it uses patchwork, and there's a lot of different patchwork servers out there, so you have to uh, go in and you know, add your patchwork URL. And then also, you can't necessarily easily query to find out what the series ID was that your series got assigned in patchwork, so you, every time you send it, you've got to go find your series ID and add it to the patch as an annotation. So, it's, it's useful if you have really long series and you get lots of tags, but I tend not to use it. Uh, also, when I run it, I, I happen to, I use git work trees in my repo and, and Patman doesn't seem to like it, so. But I was at least showing you here, uh, I did set it up and get it briefly working. You could say Patman status on my series and it would tell me all the tags for, that showed up on the, the patchwork server and then I could use dash D to write them to a new branch. It will, when it collects tags, it doesn't just modify your patches. It creates a new branch and then picks all of your patches to the branch and then adds the tags to it. So that way it doesn't possibly, it couldn't possibly screw anything up about your original patch series. I already talked about the little bit that uh, Patchman call, Patman calls get maintainer on everything and it calls it on individual patches 
in your series. So every patch gets get maintainer called on that patch, and the people get maintainer fingers for that patch get CC'd on that patch. And so this is a good bad thing. So if you've ever, I've gotten certainly gotten yelled at before by people that say, hey, you sent me a series, but you only CC'd me on patch two. You know, I'm not going to look at your patch until you CC me on the whole series because you can't get context with just seeing patch two in the series when maybe all the context was provided in patch one. And so some maintainers will get mad at that. I guess maybe especially maintainers that don't, that want to work offline in email and they can't just go to lore and, and go look up your series. So you do send, tend to get that um, sometimes. But it also is a good thing because, you know, I've certainly received patch series where, you know, it's a 30 patch long series cleaning up the same thing in 30 different drivers. And I really don't want to be CC'd on all 29 drivers that are not my driver, right? I just want to see the one that I care about. So in that case, it, Patman's behavior is totally the right thing. It would be nice if there was, uh, maybe the default should be to CC everyone and maybe there should be a flag for it. But right now, if you want to CC everyone on your series, you have to manually process get maintainer and add them as series CCs. Uh, I also mentioned down here, you can use subject, Patman has another feature for CCing people based on subject line, but it's more in U-boot. Uh, I also will say, originally I said the problem with the email workflow is you need an SMTP server. Patman doesn't solve this. You totally still need a, an SMTP, SMTP server, and uh, it doesn't help you there. I also do mention that if you're looking for an SMTP server and you're brand new to Linux development, and you think, I'll just open a Gmail account and use that SMTP server, uh, it's probably not a good idea uh, unless you're sending it. it if you're using Gmail, your Git authorship, the email address associated with Git has to match your Gmail account because Gmail will silently, as you send it, rewrite whatever your from address is with whatever your Gmail account is. And so <clears throat> if you just think that you can log in with Gmail and use it as your SMTP server, your from address won't match your signed off by address and then everyone will yell at you for it. So. Uh, if you're going to use Gmail, you need to use that actual Gmail to send your patches. And I guess the last thing here is a feature I kind of like about Patman is when you call it, it will do all the formatting uh, of your patches for you and give you one last chance to review them. It opens them all up in your editor, and you can cycle through them in your editor and check out the patches one last time before you send. So it's something I like about it. So last chance for questions, I'll uh, move to B4, and then we can talk at the end if anyone has any. Did, did your stuff get addressed for how the series looked good? Okay. So I had to do a, an obligatory generative AI uh, for B4 as well. I, I went a little bit dystopian here because I figured that if Patman was the superhero that solves crimes by patting people on the head, B4 was a superhero that solves crimes before they happened. And so, you know, he, 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 it's a little evil, right? Because, like, do you, can you get arrested for something you haven't done yet? But anyway, sci-fi. Yes, exactly. Uh, and so B4 is a tool from kernel.org uh, written by Constantine. I'm not going to pronounce his last name. I'm sorry, Constantine. Uh, and he's the maintainer. And so some of what I'm talking about is duplicated in a video that Constantine did when he first introduced B4 for sending patches. And so I have a link to it here. Um, I did find it slightly amusing that it ended in part one, and then I went looking for part two and couldn't find it. But, <laughs> um, but uh, what's that? Oh, I should have looked for part zero. Oh, you're right. OK. Uh, so B4 is actually, you know, it's a number of tools. So B4 can send patches as of recently, but B4 actually also has tools for grabbing patches from the mailing list, and it has a whole bunch of other like maintainer-friendly tools for like sending thank yous to patches that got applied, and a whole pile of stuff. So like B4 is an amazing tool. I still use Patman at the moment to send patches, but I still use B4 occasionally to like apply patches because it, it's so easy and, and awesome. 
So, and as I said before, is is pretty new, but it's it's gotten a lot of adoption from the community because it's from Kernot Org and kind of got a lot of word of mouth at conferences like this. Uh, like I said, Dimitri just had a, a talk about sending patches and you know espoused the virtues of B4 you know to everyone, and that's great because it's a great tool. But uh, it it got popularity whereas Patman didn't. So B4 is, kind of has a lot of the same features uh, as Patman. It actually has an extra feature where you don't need the SMTP server. Uh, it can send patches straight through Lore's uh, public inbox interface. And it has a whole method for establishing your identity and, and getting keys and things like that. And I'll go through that uh, next. It can also call get maintainer for you. Uh, but it does it in a very different way. It has a different idea of how that should be done. It can grab reviewed by and tested by type tags uh, in an actually much better way than Petman does. Because it, it goes to lore, and so it, it knows where the previous versions were and, it, and without you having to tell it. And also, lore just has all messages, right? So it, it just works flawlessly. It also does create a prettier message ID, kind of like Patman does with change ID, less unwieldy uh, because it, it does it in a different way. It thinks of like uh, change ID is more associated with a series than an individual patch. And it also doesn't use that giant string that Garrett comes up with. Uh, it also does think cool things like populates lore.kernel.org links, which is really nice to look for old versions because it, again, it has that tight integration with lore. And so it knows where the old patches were. And it auto-increments the patch version, which I don't care much about, but it's a niceism. So. so B4's basic premise, you know, it, it's the same. You, you're going to you know, add some metadata, and it's going to help B4 run. In this case, you call B4 prep and uh, give it a branch name instead of starting your branch your normal way. And then before, like you saw in Patman, it had that slightly confusing, you stick metadata randomly throughout your patch series. And that's a little weird. B4 centralizes that. And by default, it will create an empty commit where it stores all of its metadata. And so that can be good. It's less confusing than having it sprinkled through a bunch of patches. But it also has some downsides. One of the downsides is you had to deal with a, a git empty commit, which git sometimes isn't that happy about. Uh, you occasionally have to do things like, you know, git cherry pick allow empty or something like that if you want to uh, keep the commit moving forward because git likes to strip empty commits. Um, and there's other places. B4 has a bunch of options. If you like storing the, the stuff in other places, you can store it in the, the metadata as well. But that has its own different downsides. So basically, as I said, you, you create this branch. It creates that empty commit for its metadata. Once you've added all of your stuff, you can you know, call get maintainer, and it will add uh, twos and cc's for you. And then you can edit the cover letter with it. That's the basic premise. I'm going to take a slight jump to uh, talking about the SMTP, SMTP stuff uh, with not having SMTP. Uh, on B4, and then we'll get back to some of the nitty-gritty details about how to format your patches with B4. So, like I said, you can you can get away with not having to use SMTP with B4. Uh, it's mostly useful for corp environments, uh, but I think as talked about by Constantine in his talk about this, is it doesn't totally get rid of a lot of the needs you might need from your corp environment. So. In order to send a patch, you, you can now send it without SMTP, SMTP. God, I can't say that today. Uh, but you still need to be able to respond and interact with the upstream community and respond in plain text email to them. And so if your company cannot support the ability for you to respond to mailing lists in plain text email, you're still going to have trouble. And so it was there was the question of like, how much of an intersection are there with people who can't get an SMP, SMTP server but can respond in plain text email? Maybe it's fine, but uh, something to think about. Anyway, it's still great that, that it provides the option. And so I have some commands. I'm not sure I really need to go over all these because it's just all documented uh, fairly well in B4. But you basically, you can generate a key, and you store the, the key in your git config. 
And then you ignore this part of pat at. This confused me a little bit when I followed Constantine's instructions, which is why it's in red. Then you, you configure, do some more git config, tell b4 to, to send lore.kernel.org an authorization message so they can confirm your email address. They'll send you the email with the one-time code confirming that you can receive email, and then you tell b4, hey, here's the code I got. Ironically, when I did this to test for this talk, uh, it ended up in my spam folder. But um, So check your spam folder. It, it gave me a little bit of a worry that if I used this method for sending mail that things might end up in maintainer spam folders, but maybe it's just the authorization email, so hopefully. Uh, I actually talked a lot about this already. Uh, the B4 metadata, like I said, by default, it's in an empty commit. Sometimes you have to deal with that. Uh, if you normally the B4 metadata is not intended for you to go edit it manually, you can if you want to. It's just uh, commit text. But they have tools like B4 prep edit cover, which lets you edit the cover letter. And like I said, you can uh, say there's a B4 command for adding twos and CCs, and there's B4 commands for incrementing version numbers manually, and all of this stuff. So anything that's in the metadata, there's a B4 command for messing with it. I will mention that, remember I said that everyone's a little confused by a patman by sprinkling your tags everywhere throughout the commit? And that's weird, because a lot of the tags apply to the whole series. B4 actually has the exact opposite problem. <laughs> so uh, B4, by default, that, that empty commit, that metadata, has a cover letter in it. Well, a cover letter doesn't make sense for a single patch. So if you're sending a single patch with B4, you've got this weird thing where it says, please put your cover letter here. And it's not a cover letter. If you add text to that cover letter, it ends up after the cut for that one commit. And then the subject line of this cover letter that's not a cover letter is ignored. And so there's confusion in both ways, right? Like no matter how you slice it, you're going to be confused sometimes. But this is essentially what the before empty commit looks like. You've got the tag, the cover letter subject, and tag, which is ignored if it's just one commit. You've got your cover letter text, which is your after the cut if it's just one commit. You've got your two and CC that automatically gets populated uh, if you do B4 prep auto two CC. Like I said, very different than Patman. Patman calls get maintainer for you every time you type Patman send, it gets called. This one, you manually call it whenever you feel like the two and CC lists need to change and you need to get them again from get maintainer, and then it adds them to your, your uh, cover letter. And then, of course, it was weird to me that there was a signed off by in the cover letter, but I guess it doesn't hurt. Uh, I, I've never had it before, and no one's ever complained, but sure. And then, of course, it shows you the metadata that you're not normally supposed to edit manually. Um, and one thing here is you can see change ID, which is different than the Garrett change ID, different than the Patman change ID. This is sort of the, the B4 change ID and is, can be used for B4 to tell that your series is a new version of a pre previous series. Their change ID is at a series level, not a commit level. So they use this metadata. But you do have to be careful, because when you run B4 prep and you tell it what your local branch name is going to be, that's going to become part of this change ID. And so it will be broadcast to the world. So if you, you know, use some profanity, you're like, fix the bleeping bug, and then you send it out, it's going to show to the world that you know, your branch name was called fix the bleeping bug, and maybe Hopefully, people won't be offended. Um, <clears throat> before, before you send things for B4, you can say B4 prep compare to the previous version. This is actually a really cool feature of B4, uh, that you can get a diff to see how your patch series differed, so you, you can make sure it looks right. Uh, I often do this manually myself. I, I actually do a git log dash dash patch of all my things and like compare the git log of everything. Uh, but B4 does it for, for you, or it can help you with it. Uh, you can be, like I said, when you run Patman, it opens your editor with all the patches before sending them. Before you have to manually, you can say before send dash O to a tempter, and it will show you what all the patches look like, but you need to do that yourself and look through them. And you also need to manually call check patch on all those patches. And so, yeah, or is there some automated way to this that I don't know of? Pink is being added now, so there's a before uh, prep dash dash check. Oh, cool. Okay. 
I didn't see it when I looked earlier, but uh, but maybe I missed it, or maybe like you said, it's maybe good. it's on mailing list, so soon will be added. Okay, but cool. It's in progress. I mean, that's great. I mean, it, it, every time things like this get added and get fixed, that's amazing. So, uh, and there's also this cool B4 send reflect that you can actually send the patch that looks exactly like the patch will look, but only send it to you, so you can really see it in your email client and make sure you didn't look like too much of a fool. Uh, so I'll, I'll show you what, you know, calling before send, I use the, the web endpoint to send it. And yep, it, you know, it sent my thing. And it, after I sent it, it recorded the series message ID in the cover letter because it, it knows what message ID it got. And it, that's going to help it find it on lore later. It bumped the revision for me updated the change log with some, some history and did it all you know, nice and quickly. And when I set my patch via B4, you can actually see uh, it's a little weird. Look at the from line here. So I used the web interface for B4, and it can't send patches from me from, without my SMTP server. So it actually sends it Douglas Anderson via B4 Relay. And that's fine. People, you know, this is a kernel.org tool. So if a kernel maintainer yells at you for your patch saying that, you're like, dude, no. It's like, this is officially supported, officially OK. And then it says, from dev null plus dianders.chromium.org at kernel.org. So it can send that fine. If you have a kernel.org address then, and you use B4, then it doesn't do this. And B4 can also use an SMTP server, and then it won't do this. So this is only if you want to use the web submission interface. Um, but you can see all the raw data. You know, there's B4 tracking and my you know key tags and the message ID. You can see here is my branch ID. Here is the date I sent it. Here is the version. So it does create this nice uh, message ID as well. And I think this is the base branch that I based on. The commit of the base branch I based on. Oh yeah, it is because it also shows it down here. Once I send, B4 updates the metadata for you. It, in your cover letter, it says, hey, you need to edit and add some new change logs. And then, it, like I said, it updates your revision for you and, and does stuff like that. Adds some history of what all the old change IDs and things were. Now, one thing that I'll notice here, I'll, I'll mention here, I guess maybe I'm cutting to the, the chase a little bit. But B4 really, you can see the version history here is really on a patch series basis, not on a patch by patch basis. So on B4, it kind of, it helps you and encourages you to just send version history in the cover letter. And then it's up to you to figure out if you want to add version history per patch. And if you do that, you have to do that all yourself in your own formatting, right? And so it's, it's a very different approach to how Patman works. Patman is really focused on that version history on per patch, and the cover letter is just the aggregate of them. And uh, B4 is really helping you keep track and, and give you that nice final cover letter version history, but doesn't give you any help at all for the per patch version history. So more and more, as more people are using B4, I notice that they don't tend to have version history in each patch, which is a little annoying to me, but you know, whatever. Uh, let's see, did I say anything? No, I already talked about this. Uh, automatically adds a link, which is amazing. It puts the base commit in there, which Patman, I think that's a git feature, but Patman doesn't do it. Uh, and it's got a change ID to help bots out. Yeah, you forgot about the tag. It creates a tag automatically. A tag, oh. It's cool because it creates a tag with the patch. So it, it creates a tag? A local git tag? Yeah, you, on uh, the previous slide, it, uh, when you sent the... Uh, oh, I may not have copied that part. Oh, uh, up here. Yeah. So it sent a tag, it creates a tag on top, tagging, oh. which ah, are the, okay. the, the patches yeah. without the empty commit. Okay. And the cover letter is in the tag description. Ah, okay. So in fact, you can rebase other code on this tag, and uh, it won't conflict because you cannot add a, a before empty commit on another branch with an empty commit. Okay. So if you want to accumulate multiple uh, patch patches, uh -huh. patch series, you can use the tags, merge the tags, and add another patches on top. Oh, okay. Which is really well designed, I mean. Okay, 
Cool, I didn't know that. I mean, like I, I have, like I said, I've barely used before because I've been using Patman for so long. So, so thanks. If you have a lot of, of uh, patch cherries on top of uh, like uh, upstreaming uh, SOC support, for example, yeah. you can have all these tags merge them on, uh, on top yeah. and add your own uh, work in progress on top and it won't collide. Everything is all fine. And you don't want that, won't have to uh, cherry pick every, every patch manually. So it's pretty, it's a good feature. Cool, thanks. Uh, so comparing and contrasting. Uh, I mean, I've already kind of been doing this throughout the whole thing. They're, they're both great tools. Uh, I think, honestly, you know, both of the tool tools could adopt the stuff from the others, and that would be amazing. Uh, and hopefully people you know, see this and they're like, oh, that's a great Patman tool or feature, or that's a great B4 feature, and, and add things to them. That'd be awesome. Um, but the major difference and fundamental design difference is just the Patman sticking the tags in each individual commit uh, and before having that one big metadata thing. And I guess maybe one or the other could try to adopt something like that if people really wanted to, but it seems like that's really the fundamental difference between the two. And so why you might want to use B4 if you, if you like that empty commit, there's certainly there's a lot of nice new features that B4 has and it has the very tight integration with lore, which is great. Uh, it's also 100% no one could ever complain to you if you sent your patch with B4 and B4 did something weird because you're con contributing to the kernel and it's a kernel.org officially supported tool. So uh, the no SMTP can be nice and you know all that stuff. Uh, Patman, like I said, I really like the, the version history and, and sort of things getting tagged in individual commits kind of speaks to me, having all those tags there uh, is nice for me. And for me, the, the change ID is kind of the, the deal breaker for B4. Uh, I really, really, that's just my workflow is to work in the same kernel tree and having that Garrett commit hook is just always going to be adding change ID back and I'm always going to forget it. So having that stripping is nice. Something, it wouldn't be hard for B4 to do that, but it doesn't right now. And I like some of the automated stuff that it does as well, like automatically calling check patch and stuff. And that's it. So thanks for coming, and hopefully people found something interesting. One more thing uh, for before is that it uses the patch attestation. So when you send the patches, it's cryptography signs them, and then when you apply, the maintainer applies the patches through before, then you, this attestation can be checked. So I guess Batman uh, doesn't do this. I mean, you just get DKIM checking, right? So yeah. presumably DKIM checking is still pretty decent, yes. uh, because if you're sending your SMTP server, and that's theoretically authenticating who you are. Except with when you use Google for sending, because Google rotates the keys, and after one month, Oh, is that why DKM <laughs> always yells at me for Gmail stuff? Yes. Or uh, occasionally yells at me and then stops yelling at me and then starts yelling at me? Exactly. Oh, I mean, God. this is actually a problem, I think, at the Python tool because it follows, checks the... Uh, I mean, yeah, Google rotates the keys and the keys is not valid anymore and the tool respects this and the tool should just ignore this invalid time, like not valid after. Got it. But uh, several maintainers are confused about this, so uh, even top maintainers refuse sometimes to take patches uh, also from, from us because we use sometimes Google ser server. Right. Uh, that would also, would that still be a problem if you used B4 and used SMTP or it still, it still signs it? Uh, I mean, the, the problem is uh, for the Gmail server, so if you use the Gmail as, right, a, okay. as a SMTP. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, the patch attestation is separate here. Yeah. Likewise, so it's okay. If, if the DKI AM chef fails, yeah. we, we add your uh, GPG key and it Oh, fails. that's so true. It, then, so you can okay. still work around maybe yeah. the, the Gmail SMTP problems if you sign it with your GPG key, yeah. which B4 can do. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Thanks. Sorry for being a little over time. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.